Hey, how's it going everybody? Ted Purchase here, Bold Lens Photography, and today I'm going to be uh, taking you guys outside and we're going to go do some landscapes. Um, one reason why I created this channel is that when I was first starting out and learning as a photographer, I was watching videos on YouTube and I always felt like I had to go through and get bits and pieces of information and put them together in in order to learn something and so one of the biggest reasons why I started this channel was that I wanted to go do some instructional videos where I'm going through step by step showing you exactly what I'm doing each step of the way every setting on my camera my ISO my aperture um, all those things why you know what what type of mode that I'm shooting in and and why I'm doing it so and uh, just decided for my first one you know to keep it real simple it's just going to be a very very basic landscape for beginners so if you're uh an advanced photographer that's been shooting for several years this this video might not be for you but if you're new you know you're just starting to learn about aperture and iso and you're ready to go and put that stuff out in the field then uh stay tuned we're going to be going out and doing some landscapes um you know, one of the first steps that you do when you're going to go out and do any kind of shooting is, you know, you're going to get your gear ready. And just to kind of talk to you about what I'm using today, it's just going to be this right here. There's not going to be any tripods, not going to be using any filters, any triggers. This is really basic. All that stuff's good to get later down the road when you know more about landscapes. But you should really be able to go out and get some halfway decent landscapes with you know, just a basic entry level camera and a lens, um, you know, just a kit lens. This one right here, this is the uh, 14 to 42 Olympus kit lens. You can see it extends out like that. It, real cheap, basic kit lens. And uh, as far as the body goes, this is, this is a uh, EM10 Mark II. And uh, if you are looking at getting some photography gear, you can actually get the original EM10. I was just looking on eBay. They have that for $130 and it can do almost everything that this thing is. It's almost the same camera. That's only $130 used on eBay was the cheapest price. And you could find this lens for like $60. You can, you know, it really doesn't take a whole lot of money to get a decent uh, setup for going out and shooting landscapes. And, uh, you know, if you want to get a different camera too, that's fine. Uh, as far as suggestions go, I'd definitely say if you're on a real tight budget, you can't go wrong with an EM10 and just this cheap kit lens. Um, if you want to uh, do something a little bit different, the Sony a6000 is also really cheap, not that much more than this. And you can get a kit lens with that and, and that won't cost, you know, hardly anything. It's going to be, uh, it's going to have some pluses and minuses. It's a big sensor, so... It's going to be a little bit better dynamic range and that kind of thing but uh you know this this has some really cool features that the sony uh doesn't like uh you know this has built-in image stabilization which is really nice you could do uh long exposures with live composite it'll show you the exposures going on it, it's it's really nice and also another good choice for micro four thirds if you want a camera that i feel is a little bit more robust a little bit better uh, the GX85 Panasonic, that's also a really good choice. It's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks more than probably either the Sony or the uh, Olympus. But when the, it goes on sale for some crazy good deals sometimes. So I'd definitely check that out. One thing always crazy handy for shooting landscapes is a uh, flip screen. It's definitely one of the biggest things that I would look for in a camera. If you're looking to shoot landscapes, you know, you flip screen to me is just a must have these days for almost any photography especially landscapes as far as a lens you know you could do a lot with a regular basic kit lens there's a lot of people that think you can't get good pictures with it but you know it's slow and it doesn't really have a lot of range but a lot of them especially uh, when I shot with Nikon the kit lenses for that were actually really good uh, especially the 18 to 55 AFP was actually one of my favorite Nikon lenses. It had insane quality, actually a lot better quality than this. Um, but this one's still pretty good. Uh, um, one thing that a lot of people like to go with is ultra wide. So, you know, those can get kind of spendy. That that might be something you would uh, look down the road later at getting something like that. But just to start off, you know, I just stick with a kit lens and, uh, 
Yeah, and that's uh, pretty much it. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to pack our stuff up and go do some landscape photos. Okay, guys, I'm uh, all set up right now. Um, so like I was saying, this kind of shot, we could easily do this handheld. I just got a tripod here just for uh, purposes of making the, uh, the video here. But this is a pretty nice little uh, spot up right outside my house. Um, as far as the composition goes, uh, we'll just go ahead and run through that real quick. So I definitely like to stay uh, low to the ground and uh, usually try and get a little bit of foreground in, but here we can't really uh, do that all that much. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just kind of going to get it high up and we're just going to be really just soaking in this view. But, you know, when it comes to the composition, that's just uh, one thing that it can... Uh, everything can change you know depending on what kind of camera you got your skill set where you're going all, all that kind of stuff what kind of lens you're using so I just encourage you to kind of go and uh, go online look at different people's photos see ones you like maybe try and do you know get some inspiration on a composition from them but okay so let's go ahead and just show you how we got this set up so I'm going in uh, aperture priority right now and I'll show you how to do this again in manual just so you guys can learn manual but you can do this just fine in aperture priority let me actually go ahead and zoom out here a little bit I'm going to go ahead and just bring this up here a little bit so you guys can see okay so let's go ahead and look at our settings real quick Okay, let's see here. Oops. Wait one second, guys. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's been a while since I used this camera. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the ISO. We're at 200, so that's the lowest you can go ISO on this camera, um, unless you go into boosted mode, which doesn't really matter, but we'll just go ahead and keep that at uh, ISO 100 or ISO 200, you guys will probably be 100 if you're using a crop sensor or a full frame. That's what most cameras are. Most Micro Four Thirds are 200 ISO for their uh, lowest that they can go. And that's just going to get you the cleanest image. Okay, white bounce, auto. We're also going to be shooting in raw here. Uh, we're not too worried about the autofocus. I'm just using single point, single uh, autofocus right now. We're using a silent shutter. It's one of the nice things about mirrorless is this is just gonna get rid of any uh, shock that you have. Um, a lot of the DSLRs, they have things on there like mirror up mode that they can use. And that will just kind of help you get rid of some of that uh, shock. Let's see, we're in raw here. Matrix metering mode, so it's gonna meter the whole scene. And yeah, that's just pretty much all that really matters if you're shooting raw. Don't worry about any of this stuff because I'm not shooting uh, JPEG. I'm going to be shooting raw for this one. So, okay, now that we have that, let's go ahead and pop this back up here. Okay, so this lens right now, we're set to the widest that we can go is 14 millimeters. So, you know, you can just start it off wide. If you want to zoom in a little bit, you can. I kind of like it right here at 14. Just depends on the scene. Depends on uh, what you're going to do and all that. And, uh... We have this in aperture priority mode, so you can see right here, down right there, we're actually controlling the uh, aperture on this. So we're just gonna keep that right at about 5.6. Everything should be in focus. And uh, when we get back, I'll go ahead and go over a depth of field calculator. It's definitely something you wanna check in. But basically, if you're, uh, you wanna stop down to uh, about where your lens is the sharpest. If you stop down too much, you're gonna start getting diffraction and you don't want diffraction. It's gonna make your picture look worse, especially if everything's already sharp. So a lot of times if you're still, you know, if you got foreground that isn't in focused, what I would actually probably do is try and uh, maybe raise your tripod up or shoot a little bit higher, stand a little bit further back. So anything in the foreground or the ground itself is gonna be further away from you. You can also try to go wider, use a wider lens. And then if you really need to stop down, uh, then you can go ahead and stop down if you absolutely have to, past the point where you're gonna get the uh, sharpest pictures. So now that we have that set, 
Okay, we don't have to worry about our shutter speed because we're in aperture priority mode. So the only thing we're worried about now is our exposure. So if I just go ahead and take a picture right now, ISO 200, aperture priority mode, F5.6. And I'm gonna go ahead and focus just about right there on the middle. That should get everything in focus just fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at that picture. You can see right here, we're pretty much golden. Just, I mean, this is completely usable. We have great weather right now. The sun's at my back, which is perfect, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys one more thing here real quick. So I could shoot it like that, or I can actually use my second dial, and this is my exposure compensation dial. Now you can see here, since I got a mirrorless, it's gonna show you as I go. And if I go a little bit too much, then you're gonna see these uh, highlight, these red highlight warnings come up. So I'm actually gonna go just about right here, so plus one, and then go ahead and just retake the picture there. And we are good to go. And what this is gonna do is this is just gonna maximize the amount of information we're getting on our raw file so we can get the most detail out of those shadows possible. And uh, let me go ahead and just show you here on manual mode what we could do. Just go ahead and switch this over to manual. And this is just really going to be the same thing, except for the back controls are uh, aperture. So we'll just leave that at 5.6. Then all I got to do is I just sit here and I look down at my meter. Okay, so we're way, oops, going the wrong way. <laughs> so we're way overexposed here. You can see the red highlight warning. And uh, let's go ahead. Right there, we're in manual, and that way we just don't have to worry about any weird shifts. Go ahead, let's, let's go ahead and focus down there. Boom. There we go. Almost exactly the same. It actually is pretty much all the exact same settings. I just did it in manual versus aperture priority mode. So, and that's basically it. And just to uh, show you guys here really quick. Let me go ahead and get this off. Oops. Let's go ahead and just take another one really quick here. I just wanted to do one really quick uh, handheld so that way you guys can see that this is completely possible to do handheld and uh yeah that's uh we're pretty much good here so let's go ahead and get these in the uh computer and uh we'll start editing them okay guys one thing that i uh, wanted to get into really quick before we started getting to the editing is the uh aperture and some of my other settings and because i just didn't really have a lot of time to go over it when i was shooting that little uh viewpoint actually gets pretty busy so i was trying to wrap it up as quick as i can but just to kind of show you guys here what i was talking about about stopping down to f5.6 one thing that i highly recommend is going online and this is a really good website photozone.de and just type in that in google and your lens and see if they have a review that pops up and what you're going to want to do is it's going to come up it's going to show you distortion and and some of this other stuff and you're going to want to go down to where it says uh mtf resolution and you're going to see a few charts like this so the first one is going to be at 14 millimeter which is what we're going to be shooting at most of the time now if you look at these bars right here we have aperture values f3556 f8 f11 and you could see the uh, the higher the bar is, the sharper your image is going to be. And this is uh, your center, your outside edges, and then your extreme uh, outside edges right here. And it's just a, always a good thing to look it up. As you can see, I'm shooting at five f5.6, which is the sharpest that my lens can go. Now I could go down to uh, f8, and you could see I actually lose quite a bit of sharpness here. And uh, so if you go down a little bit on these lenses, like on micro four thirds, if you got to go down a little bit to F8 or even something like F11, you know, diffraction is going to set in. It's going to make your image a little bit blurrier, but it's, if you need to do it, you need to do it. It's not too bad. When you start to get to extreme, uh, 
stopping down like f16 that's where it, it's getting really bad so what i usually like to do is if i have to i'll shoot wider i'll uh, tilt up a little bit or i'll move my tripod up to you know get everything further away from my camera to try and get everything in focus and looking at the uh, picture that i took um just the little little bit of ground right at the bottom uh wasn't in focus and let me uh let me go ahead and pop over here so this is the uh, nikon uh, 18 to 55 f35 to 5.6 this is the vr2 version of it and so this is just you know pretty common lens that a lot of people would have you see this one's also sharpest at uh, 18 millimeters at f5.6 but when you stop down to f8 with the nikon it barely loses any quality at all and uh looks like even some of the edge quality comes up right here so that's usually when I was shooting with Nikon a lot of times I would just go ahead and go down to f8 because it was pretty much just as sharp as f 5.6 but um, it, it uh, you know you get that extra depth of field so everything can come in a little bit clearer if something's a little close to you you know the, the uh, the ground or, or some sort of foreground object is really close to you then you definitely want to be at f8 and there's kind of no reason not to go with it and uh, let me go ahead and show you this right here this is a depth of field calculator so if you guys want to find this just uh, I'll put the links for both of these websites down in the description um, but this is Cambridge in color uh, depth of field calculator and what you do is you just put in your camera type right here so your sensor so uh, if you're using a micro four third sensor you just put in four dash three sensor if you were going with you know a nikon then what you'd want to do is dslr with a crop factor of one five and canon would be a one six so if we go ahead and go to nikon right here we're at 1.5 x select the aperture that you're going to shoot at or you want to shoot at so let's go ahead and put it at f8 because that's what i'd be shooting with if i still had nikon and instead of 14 we're going to be shooting at 18 millimeters and right here the focus distance we're trying to get everything in focus so that's just going to be uh you know the uh pretty much the infinity distance and you can see everything here from 1.89 meters to infinity which is pretty much as far as you can go it's the moon <laughs> so everything from 1.89 meters away from you to the moon should be in sharp focus and the wider you go the wider your depth of field is that's why it's always nice to uh, go wide stop down that way you can get everything in focus you can sometimes do landscapes i got a few landscapes on my website where it, i'm actually focusing on something in the foreground and the landscapes kind of blur there's, there's a lot of different things you could do but being able to uh, stop down your lens set up properly know your depth of field is just a good basic core skill that you should have as a photographer and especially as a landscape photographer okay how's it going guys i uh got the image loaded up on the editor right now just to let you guys know i'm using capture one pro 11. this is kind of an expensive program it's more geared towards pros so if you're a beginner later on i'm going to be doing some videos on some cheap or free software to uh, edit your photos um, a lot of you guys are going to be using Lightroom and in those kind of programs the things that I'm going to be showing you here you're going to see a lot of similar sliders that you could use in your programs or you could always pick this up if you own a Sony it's actually really cheap they do a special discount for Sony so just keep that in mind I'd, I'd definitely get it if you have a Sony but uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this so as you could see I was talking about how the uh, ground about a little bit blurry about you know right here you could see where that starts as I come up it's nice and clean um, remember when I was taking the shot I was talking about shooting at ISO 200 that's uh, you you always want to get that ISO as low as you possibly can and you're, you're basically just going to be using that shutter speed to control your exposure and to get it uh, exposed as best you can when I was showing you uh, some of the other pictures there let's go ahead and take a look at them let's go ahead and take a look at this first one here you can see this one is not doesn't have as much exposure as the one 
that I was just on. This would be like if you just had your meter set to zero or you threw it on aperture priority and took the picture and our lighting was so good that it's still you, you don't have to worry about it. This this would work, but I really want you guys to learn how to expose to the right and kick up that exposure without blowing out your highlights. This button right here, this is going to show me if I have any blown highlights, which you could see right here. I don't. If I did, it's going to look just like in my camera. They're going to look all red like this. Let's go ahead and put this back down. So I was able to increase my exposure, and that's going to bring as much detail as I can back into these shadows uh, without losing any information from my blown highlights. Now, if you have a DSLR and you can't, you don't have WYSIWYG and the uh, warnings for highlights and shadows like I was showing you uh, when we were up on the mountain shooting, then the easiest thing you could do is you could just do the one shot and if it looks good, like that first one that I showed you, you should be fine with that. Um, but if you are in a situation where maybe the sun's back here instead of being at your back and it's really bright and uh, there's, you know, maybe it's hitting some of these trees and they're getting really bright too or some of the reflecting off the water here, then yeah, you might want to try exposing to the right, but with a DSLR instead of just spinning it and hitting the button like I did there earlier, you would have to go take a picture, look at the back of your screen, check your uh, histogram and see if it uh, needs to be exposed to the right a little bit more and you'd have to repeat the process. So that is uh, one of the biggest reasons why I really like mirrorless cameras versus a DSLR. Um, another thing about the shutter speed is since I just had this on aperture priority mode, the shutter speed was done for me. But you see, even when I was in manual, I was just moving that shutter speed till I got me the exposure that I wanted. Now, I was, you know, I don't, I don't know what this one was at. This was, uh, let's see here. Let me go here. Oh, I don't know. I, I can't remember where to <laughs> look at the, uh, shutter speed on this but i was at something like uh you know one six hundredth of a second or, or something like that so uh, you know I, I at that point you don't even really need stabilization that bad it, it shouldn't affect it on a camera like this maybe a higher megapixel one it would but on this not having stabilization at that high of a shutter speed you know or no tripod it's it's definitely possible but one thing you're gonna have to keep in mind is you know, if I was just a couple hours later and that sun was setting down and I was losing light, I would be at a lower shutter speed and I'd have to kind of make sure that, you know, with that camera, just, uh, I mean, I could probably do like a 15th of a second comfortably, pretty much nail it every time with my uh, EM1 uh, Mark II, I could easily do a quarter or even a half a second if I needed to. Now, what you're gonna have to keep in mind is Olympus, especially their high-end one, like that EM1 Mark II, that's the best stabilization in the game. The, uh, but the, uh, you know, if you just have something like a regular Canon or Nikon kit lens or a Sony that has the built-in stabilization inside the lens at 18 millimeters, you should probably be able to at least do, you know, a 15th or a 30th of a second. It, it just kind of depends on you. It depends on how steady your hands are, uh, where you're standing, and and uh, you know the stabilization how good the stabilization is and all that kind of thing so you know it's just you're gonna have to experiment with your own camera at different shutter speeds and see what you're capable of hand holding I know what I can hand hold you got to figure out what you can hand hold and if it's you know just too slow then you're, you're gonna either have to stop it down you're gonna have to increase your ISO a little bit but the best thing to do would be to get a tripod which is that's most uh, um, people that do landscapes at night, uh, they're going to be using a tripod because they're doing really long exposures. Or if you're using an ND filter for a long exposure, if you want to stack multiple images, um, even though you can auto align them these days pretty good, it's still always nice to have a, a tripod in case that fails. So that's just, you know, the basic three things that you got to worry about is your aperture, your ISO, and your shutter speed things like white bounce that doesn't really matter if you're shooting raw and you should be shooting raw if you're not shooting raw and you're shooting jpeg i highly suggest at the very least turning your camera onto raw plus jpeg but with these cameras in order to really get the maximum amount out of them and get the best looking image in my opinion 
you should be shooting raw and using a uh, program to edit them. So let me go ahead and uh, let's get cracking into it and get this picture edited. So the first thing, this is the last one that I took. I just did this one handheld just to show that yes, you know, I don't need a tripod to do a shot like this. I don't think anybody should, but you can see it's a little bit crooked. Definitely you, you want to try and get as straight as you can when you're shooting it. And a lot of times you want to get plumb, so like vertically straight. And this one, I was actually pointed up a little bit, but that, that's not as big of a deal as getting it straight here. But even this is just a real easy fix. We're just going to bring the guides up and then we are going to straighten it here. And then that's it. Let's go ahead. Oh, let's turn that off. And now the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and crop it. It was a little bit blurry right here, which it isn't a big deal. Most people just aren't going to notice that their eyes aren't going to be drawn there. But uh, let me go ahead and get this set up. So I'm actually going to go on this one just for me. I'm going to go, I really like 2, 3 ratio and 16 by 9 ratio kind of gets it wide. 16 by 9, just so you guys know, that's the ratio that most uh, 1080 uh, P screens are on, like my iPhone 7 Plus and <clears throat> this uh, this monitor that I'm using right now is a 1080 monitor. So really common size so this should fill up most monitors and, and a lot of cell phones even uh, corner to corner without any extra space so uh, it's good uh, good aspect ratio for web but you know you could kind of just crop it however you want uh, as far as the editing goes this is really where there's there's just no right way to do it especially with landscape ed editing with real estate yeah there's kind of a certain way you got to do it to get it right but with landscape you know have fun play around but i'd also you know try and take the time to learn how to just do a good basic edit like what we're going to go through today i'm not going to do anything too crazy i'm just going to do a nice solid basic edit so one thing is I'm going to go ahead and bump up sharpness on the corners. Most programs don't have this, but Capture One does, and that's just going to sharpen up the uh, outside edges here. Let me check that out. You can see here, I don't know if you guys can see it on this recording, but it's a little bit duller. Now that kind of sharpened it right up. Okay, and let's go ahead, let's go into the next tool set here, and the exposure. So uh, we overexposed it a little bit. Now what I'm gonna do, and you could do this in Lightroom and most other programs, I'm gonna go ahead and bring the highlights down. This slider's kind of reversed. And so most of them, it's like usually in the middle, like on Lightroom, and you bring it down by bringing it left. This one, you just bring it right. And if I go too much, it starts to look a little flat. Too little, it's, it's a little too bright. So I'm gonna go ahead and just bring it down, probably about halfway, about right there. And the shadows, this is going to do, this is actually going to bring the shadows up. So when I slide this over, you can see these shadows right here. We're starting to be able to see them now. A lot of times people like to have their shadows real visible. It creates this high dynamic range look. But in this particular photo, I actually don't want them up too high. It's kind of distracting. I don't want people to be distracted by this stuff here. I want them to really be focusing uh, right here on the cape. So... I'm going to go ahead and just bring these down. And it's just a real common thing to uh, lower highlights, raise shadows, especially if you're exposing to the right. Okay, let's go ahead and do the curve here. So this kind of throws a lot of people off is this uh, curve right here. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put a dot here and a dot here. And if you're a little bit intimidated by the curve, don't worry about it. But what I like to do is... This is just basically your exposure, okay? So the further left that you go, that's your darker tones. When you go further right, that's your lighter tones. This cur this line right here, if this goes up where that point is, then those darker tones are gonna get a little bit brighter. If over here where I uh, where my highlights are, if, if that goes down or up, that's gonna make my highlights a little uh, darker and it's you'll see right here when you make points you kind of see even though I didn't move this it, it kind of moved by itself so that's why I can get just a little tricky but I'm just actually gonna bring my shadows down a little bit more and my highlights are gonna go up just a tiny bit and that's gonna make it kind of contrasty right there so uh, that's pretty good for right now okay and I'm gonna go up here and 
Speaking of contrast, I might just add just a little bit. I'm trying to go for, you know, a fairly realistic look, but just a little bit better than what's coming right out of camera. Clarity is going to be the same kind of thing as contrast. You can see here it really gives it a punch. If you want a lot of punch, you know, you can push that. If you push it too much, it tends to look a little goofy. If you go this way, then it makes it really soft, which not many people like that look, but you know, I just give it a little bit right there. Don't need too much. You can always zoom in here, see how it looks. You can see sometimes it gets too contrasty. These little highlights right here, they kind of really pop out when you're zooming in. Not a big deal. We're going to go ahead and do some vignetting. All vignetting does is it, it can brighten or darken the edges of the screen. This one, I'm not going to do too much. Some people like to go a little crazy with it. I, I, I'm not a big fan of doing like a whole ton of vignetting, but I got a few pictures that are uh, have a heavy vignette on them, but I, I don't do it too much. I've seen some people go a little bit crazy with it. Now we have exposure and brightness. Now on Capture One, these kind of just do the same thing, just a little bit differently. It's kind of hard to explain. I think exposure does the overall image better um, as far as adjusting how bright it is. Brightness kind of adjusts just the shadows and the midtones, but Go ahead and set that down here and you know you just got to kind of adjust it to how you want it in, in Lightroom it's not set up like this they have whites and blacks and then you have exposure but you know the whites and blacks and that you could worry about that a little bit later that's not a big deal but just kind of you know go through we're just going to kind of expose it where we want um, sometimes if I'm not sure where the right exposure is I start to where it's too bright like this is obviously too bright and I go too bright too bright too bright too bright, too bright, too dark. Okay, so I'll just go up a little bit right there, right about uh, where we shot it after we put in uh, all these adjustments to our other tones. And then also right here we have saturation, which I'm pretty fine with the saturation on this one. It, it's just really your choice. You can go a little bit undersaturated or you can really make it stand out crazy like that. Um, I think the blues look fine. It's pretty much just blue and green in this picture. I think the blues look fine, but I'm going to go down here and I'm going to bring the greens down just a little bit. Now, if you're using Lightroom or a lot of other programs, they usually have something like this where it's going to be six different colors, blue, purple, uh, aqua, green, yellow, orange, and then uh, red. And this is no different. The only difference is you can kind of adjust them, which is kind of cool where it actually is going to affect it. But just the greens here, they're a little bit too much for me. I'd like to just take them down. Let's go ahead and just bring this to where it's hitting the yellows as well too. I'm just going to go like this and just to where about where, right where I want them. So that's not too bad. It's a little too red in there for me too. You can see here when I move that it's, it's only really affecting over here on the beach. And I'm just going to go down just a little bit on that. and yeah that's starting to look pretty good another thing that a lot of people are going to adjust is the white bounce i'm pretty happy if you want you can make it a little cool a little warm i usually don't like to go too crazy with the white bounce but that's what i was talking about when you're shooting raw you can really adjust this white bounce it, it could be really off like this and when you're raw it doesn't really matter that much it will be able to pull right back that's why i'm saying don't worry about your white bounce sticking on auto your camera should get it right most of the time but yeah, I think maybe I'll go just a little bit up. We'll just go about right there. You know, it's kind of a, it's up to you where you want to go. And uh, yeah, the only other thing I'm seeing here is uh, this sky is, could probably use a little bit of clarity. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back here and I'm going to bring a gradient filter. And you can get this in Lightroom and most other ones. Let's see going to show the mask there and this red part that's just going to whatever my settings that I put now it's only going to affect where it's red so I'm going to go here and I'm just going to increase the clarity so it doesn't look as hazy and then maybe increase the, oh, the contrast didn't really help now let's see here maybe I'll take down the exposure just a tiny bit and, and I'm going to do a tiny bit of increase 
in uh, saturation just to kind of make that sky pop out a little bit and and then there you go there's a few other things I'm pretty fine with how this is right now um, there's a uh, few other things that you could do dodge and burn uh, ultimately when it comes to the post processing especially on landscapes like this I would just really work hard on the on your core basic skills just to make a decent looking photo like this nothing too crazy and then just when you have some spare time after you learn the basics really just kind of play around with it you can do you know just a lot of different stuff I mean when it comes to post-processing the possibilities are endless there's really no wrong way and you know just just really spend some time learning your program um, when I first started shooting I was in Lightroom and I would just sit there and play around and mess with images for hours and hours you know try and watch a lot of YouTube videos ask a lot of questions check out other people's work and you'll be uh, making great photos in no time but I'd definitely be shooting raw and learning how to edit in raw and I think that's really how you can maximize the quality and the look of your image to get them exactly how you want okay guys I think that's gonna do it for today and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and if you look below in the description of this video you will see a link to my blog on my website and you'll be able to see this picture full resolution and I'm also going to throw in just a few other pictures that are landscapes that I took with a kit lens and an entry level camera. So I had the 18 to 55 VR2. I'm going to put in a couple that I did with that and the Nikon D5300. And then I'll throw in a few more that I've done uh, with the Olympus EM10 Mark II and this uh, 14 to uh, 42 lens the same one that I shot this with just to kind of show you guys that even with you know an entry-level camera and a kit lens you can actually get some really fantastic landscape photos it's 100% uh, possible to do that so hopefully this video helps you guys out if you have any questions let me know and I'll see you next time bye Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, enable notification, and comment down below. If you'd like to support this channel so I can make future content, check out my website, boldlensphotography.com, where I sell fine art prints. You can also donate money at patreon.com forward slash boldlensphotography, and I'll have links below to all my social media accounts. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Bye.